going to tell you is about something slightly different than what you've heard so far, which is a new research project the Wolf Institute is going to start undertaking. And your opportunity really is to hear a bit about the background and to feed in to the, um, uh, the job advert, for those who are interested, um, for the research fellow. It's a two-year project that we hope will actually um, attract greater funding and become a multi-year project. And the, the purpose of it is to understand and put it fundamentalism and uncovered, and it's got three tasks. So what is religious fundamentalism? How do we understand it as a system, and how does it function across not just of any one particular faith, but across not just Abrahamic faiths, which people often think about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but also uh, Hinduism and Buddhism as well. Can we create a sort of uh, uh, theological analysis, we put it as, which allows for understanding in a relatively straightforward way a complex phenomenon? And what are the similarities and differences between religious fundamentalisms? Uh, what, what are the relationships between fundamentalists and their own co-religionists? So those are the, the sort of ambitious tasks of this project. Now, to begin with, of course, you need a definition. Um, and fundamentalism is not an easy term to define. There was a major study, the last major study was done by Marty and Appleby um, in the States called The Fundamentalism Project, um, which was a generation ago, between 1987 and 95. And that is... Um, their definition. I think the interesting words that strike me are the words beleaguered believers. I think that's quite an interesting term. Um, maintaining distinctive identities as well, that preservation of identities in the society. So it'd be interesting what you have to say. So that was their, their definition for their study. And since then, there have been various additions or suggestions uh, to add to that definition. Um, so, the response to modernity, in the face of modernity. Um, Lipner, those of you will know Julius, of course, here at Cambridge, Julius Lipner, um, who talks about post-modernity. So, fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism today, in response to post-modernity. An interesting suggestion by Keppel, but without opposition, it dies. Well, that's quite interesting. So, it suggests, whether, we, whether you agree with it or not, that you have to be in response to A another, over and against A another. I think that's quite interesting. And Linda Woodhead um, talks about the domesticity of fundamentalism, the sort of warmness of fundamentalism, what makes it attractive. So those are the sorts of attempts to define what fundamentalism is. And what this project is going to do is it's proposing three different categories. Um, and again, just remember, we're trying to go across all the different, these five religions. We're trying to identify the similarities and particularities across these five faiths. But first, what's proposed is quiet or passive fundamentalism. Those groups who are simply uh, want to retain and live their life out quietly within their community. Quite an insular um, way of life. The second are those who are more uh, louder, we've called it loud, but more assertive in their fundamentalist practice. Uh, they're more out there, maybe in terms of evangelizing or other aspects of being slightly louder. And the third, and this is what the public, the general public, tend to identify with religious fundamentalists, those who are violent, those who are extreme in their beliefs and in their practices. So here are some suggested suggested um, shared characteristics across religious fundamentalisms. And again, it would be interesting to, to uh, have your, your response to that. First of all, um, the specific gender roles. We heard from Leah earlier about the sort of reproduction and issues of fertility, um, but also the role of the man, not just of the woman, very much seemed to be defined across the face. The return to this, this mythic age sort of rediscovering and bringing back this pure age seems to be a shared characteristic. The concept of, of text, of course, and scripture. Um, and I took the, added the quote from James Barr because he also wrote some important um, studies of fundamentalism, uh, actually shortly before uh, Marty and Appleby. Um, uh, and so uh, he was particularly interested in Christian fundamentalism. Um, and of course, the truth claims of fundamentalists with a capital T. Um, and the reluctance on the whole to engage in what might be called the ecumenical endeavour or the interfaith endeavour or the pluralist endeavour, um, the, 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 the essentialism of religious fundamentalism, 
uh, mentioned the anti-pluralism, and I think something that's particularly important right now is we've talked often here's the term globalization. Now, what impact is globalization, the movement not just of ideas but of people, the ease of movement? How is that impacting on religious fundamentalism? Um, and the vast majority of religious fundamentalist, fundamentalisms seem to attract a charismatic leadership. So you have a charismatic leader, and then what happens when that person dies? You have some movements that carry on living after the death of the charismatic leader. Maybe it's passed down from generation to generation. Um, but they seem to be shared characteristics that we want to explore. And then I end with just a selection, and we can do a lot more. What's so interesting is those religious fundamentalisms that are land-centered. So Jewish religious fundamentalism and Hindu religious fundamentalism are very much land-centered. Those fundamentalisms that are, share the characteristic of, of assertive evangelizing, of missionary and proselytizing activity. Looking at the tensions within religious fundamentalisms within one tradition, whether it's um, the first one, arch-orthodox Haredi, or religious nationalists within Judaism, or Catholic and Protestant fundamentalism, or Shia Sunni fundamentalisms. So we want to be able to tease, to ease those aspects out. Um, I think it's very important that I think probably the majority of people in this room, if not all of us, come from an Abrahamic tradition. But I think what is important in this project, and what differentiated from the previous projects, is seeing fundamentalism as a global phenomenon, not just as a local or limited to the Abrahamic faiths. So I'm going to stop there because I can talk for hours, as my students know, and my staff know as well. Um, and my trustees for that matter. But anyway, I would be interested in your response as literally uh, we will be um, hopefully beginning this project early next year and you'll be able to feed into it.